because we are kings and our words matter. It is the truth that you are a saint. If you don't feel like it, then start thinking like a saint, start talking like a saint, and start living like a saint, and then one day you'll start feeling like a saint. I will come and bow down at your feet, Lord Jesus, in your presence is full. There is nothing, there is no one who compares with you. I take pleasure in worshiping you, Lord. Just worship him. I will come and bow down at your feet. We've been talking about what we are or who we are and what we possess. Basically, it's about who we are, what we have, what we can do, what's possible for us and so on through Jesus Christ. Now, we'll be covering a lot of stuff in this and I've been telling you how that God called us little gods. That's a big compliment, isn't it? And it's not just a little saying, but that is true. We are meant to be little gods. There's nothing wrong with that. Because we came out of him. We have his nature and likeness. And in that sense he called us little gods. Doesn't mean to say that we are the almighty God or something like that. That would be wrong. But we are little gods in the sense that we are made in the image and likeness of God. And we are children of God and so on. God made us to be like little gods. And then we talked about the covenant. The new covenant. Covenant is a very interesting concept. Because covenant in the Old Testament times was a very serious thing. When two people made covenant it meant they shared each other's resources whenever they needed one another. 
particularly smaller people went and made big covenant with bigger people for their own protection and provision kings belonging to small territories ruling over small territories would be afraid of those that are around them wanting to come and overpower them so they will make a covenant with a king that is bigger and nicer to them and uh, in that covenant they are covered protection is given nobody will touch them because of the big king that is in support of them and so on that's the idea and when a covenant is made it is so serious that a violator of the covenant shall be killed it is a cursed thing to violate a covenant so covenant was a serious business now god uses the covenant concept in relating to us so that is why jesus took the cup on that day and said as we read in Matthew chapter 26 verse 28 he said this is the cup of my new covenant the blood that was shed for the new covenant blood of my new covenant he said so he talks in terms of the covenant and i told you covenant is the word that is translated also as testament we have the old testament and the new testament literally meaning new old covenant and the new covenant and if there is a testament then there is a testator god is the testator and when the testator dies the testament comes to life when the testator dies the will comes to life the covenant is basically a will i showed you how we should look at the bible as a will where god expresses his desire about what he wants to give us what he wants us to have and what must belong to us the almighty god and what he has bestowed upon us that is what this testament or the new testament is all about what has he given us through redemption So the testator Jesus came and died God all that he wanted to give to us he gave it to us by sending Jesus and having him die on the cross put this new covenant into effect and now all that the testament says is in effect since the death of Jesus this has come to life the will has come to life now this is the will of God i've been showing you people say well let god's will be done well this is the will of god you think god has given us this book and then said well you just read it just in case but i i'm going to do whatever i will every day no he's going to do whatever he has said in his will every day so this is serious business and uh, even before he died and went away to the father in heaven jesus began to spoke about speak about what the new covenant people will be like what will be like when this testament comes to effect what will be we be like that's the verse verse 12 talks about that he says i say to you he who believes in me the works that i do he will also do greater works than these he will do because see this is the most important thing because i go to the father he says because the new covenant is going to come into effect when i die and then i'll rise again and go to the father i'm telling you what you'll be after the new covenant comes into effect what kind of people you'll be you'll do the works that i do and greater works also you will do now this has become an untouchable verse in many circles because we find it difficult to deal with this just like that verse about mountain being removed and all of that we always put these verses aside because they, well we don't want to mess with them because this is too difficult how can jesus ever say you'll do the things i do and greater things also some people are very concerned about his glory they say what will happen to him brother then i keep doing greater things and then he gets diminished and i get i get exalted i become bigger than him what is this it can't happen i can't believe he said it so we'll understand it only in heaven as one fellow said so let's close it down and let's not deal with it we'll understand it only in heaven no it's too late to understand it then <laughs> because he said after you go to the father this is what you'll be doing here on this earth so i want to understand it now because he left this verse for those people who live in the times immediately after he dies and goes back to the father in heaven it is for us particularly for us so i showed you how this verse is true it's not just a thing that he spoke and uh, it is something that is real and it means what it says and how can it mean what it says verse 13 and 14 is a thing that explains it to us it says whatsoever you ask in my name that i will do that the father may be glorified in the son if you ask anything in my name i will do it now this is not prayer prayer is a little different if you read chapter 16 verse 23 their prayer 
is stated in a totally different language. He said, you ask the father in my name and my father will give it to you. That's a different language. He says, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. Now, I showed you that the word ask here means a demand. Jesus, if you remember when he healed people, he never prayed a prayer. He demanded that they rise up and walk. He demanded they be set free. He demanded they be healed. He said, be healed, simply, that's all. He never prayed for a person. You can't see him praying anywhere. You simply see him commanding and demanding that it be so. And when he was about to die and go back to the Father, he said, now I'm going, but don't leave the world without a command and a demand. I'm going to keep you here. You continue demanding in my name. Keep doing what I did. You do it in my name. When you do it in my name, whatever I did, that will happen. Because you're doing it in my name. I showed you what the name is. The name is actually power of attorney. Power of attorney is where you are given the power to operate as if that person is in existence there or that person lives there. If I give you power of attorney, I may be absent from the country or from the city and you can operate in my place, sign my name to it and whatever transactions you put into effect becomes my transactions. I cannot tomorrow deny that I entered into this contract or I did sell this or I did by this and so on. Whatever you sign my name to it, that becomes my signature. Literally, it's like I signed it. That's power of attorney. It's like I did it. I will be responsible for it because I gave you power of attorney. Now, Jesus, before he went to the Father, he said, I give you power of attorney. That's the way to understand it. To use my name. You do it in my name. And when you do it, even though you do it, it's really I'm doing it. You're doing it in my name. You see, and it's like I do it. That is why there's no problem with it. You don't have to worry about Jesus losing his fame or glory or anything like that. No, it's not me. I'm doing it in his name. So I can do the things that he did. And I can even do greater things than he did because I don't do it in my name or in my power. I do it in his name and in his power, I do it. Hello. So there's no conflict there. There's no problem understanding this thing. But there is one thing there that I left out saying. And that is this, because he said after he goes to the father, people will, in the new covenant, people will do the things he did and greater things also. I say to you one thing, and I want to put it forth before you as a challenge, that we as a new covenant people are so blessed and we live in such an age as a new covenant people, that we should expect to do the things that Jesus did and even greater things. We should not shy away from this. We should expect greater things. I don't think we have arrived. I don't think we, have, we can say, well, we have known all the truth and we've had a whole lot of preaching about this and that and we've learned everything and we've done everything. We've been quite successful and this is it. No, this is only the beginning, my friend. Jesus, I believe the words of Jesus. He said, you will do the things that I did. And I want to do the things that he did. And I want to do greater things also. I will not shy away from it because when I do greater things, all the benefit all the blessings, all that comes out of the greater things that I do will come to me, but all the glory and the praise and the honor belongs to Jesus. Now that's a good deal, isn't it? I don't want the glory and the honor. I just want the blessings and all the things that God wants to give me so that I can do his work in this world. And I want to glorify God more than anything. I want the glory to belong to him. So, Expect great things. How many of you think you're going to expect great things in 2009? Expect to do the things that Jesus did and greater things also. Greater things. Mighty things. Unbelievable stuff. Jesus has never done it, but we're going to do it. Believe me. Jesus in his lifetime never did it, but we will do it. And when we do it, it is in his name we'll do it. In his power we'll do it. And all the glory will belong to him. But all the benefit will come to us. Amen. All right. Let's go to the next uh, verse. Chapter 1 of Romans. I told you the new covenant begins at the death of Jesus, right? Only when the testator dies, the testament or the covenant comes into effect. So the new covenant technically begins right there. So the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And most of the material in the gospels is, new covenant, uh, is the old covenant material. Because the new covenant begins only at the death of Jesus. In the Gospels, you'll find only the last couple of chapters covering the death of Jesus. So all the material before that, the ministry of Jesus, John the Baptist, and the disciples of Jesus, 
before Jesus died, all of that is ministry under old covenant, technically. From the death of Jesus, new covenant starts. So I told you, technically, from Romans only, new covenant testament is there. New, the new covenant and all that God gives us is recorded from Romans all the way up. Acts, I'm kind of leaving out because it's only history, basically, what the early church did and so on. Uh, maybe you can say that, yeah, they, as a new covenant people, they showed what you can do. Yeah, that's there. But from Romans, there is a statement of what we will be and what we are and what we can do. There is a clear statement teaching concerning what belongs to us and who we are. So uh, that's why I'm going to begin with Romans. In Romans chapter 1, let me read to you verse 6 and 7. Or let me read to you verse 1 and then we, uh, then let's read uh, uh, later verses. Paul, a born servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Hello. Called to be saints. Everybody say, I'm called to be saint. Now, as soon as we say, say saint, people are thinking, well, for to be a saint, you've got to be dead at least for a thousand years, you know. That's when you can be saint. <laughs> Some people think like that, you know. Uh, but really, the Apostle Paul, if you read all of his epistles, you know, and most of his epistles, in the first chapter itself, you'll notice this very characteristic. That characteristically, he opens the epistle like this. He calls them saints. He addresses them as saints. I'm writing to the saints in Corinth, saints in Rome, saints in Ephesus and so on. You know, he's always writing to the saints. He's calling the believers as saints. Now, some people have a problem with that. They say, brother, I don't feel like a saint. Really, to tell you the truth, I don't feel like a saint. A lot of Christians, especially in India, they don't feel like a saint. Because we've been told that we are no saint. We are sinners, in fact. We are sinner of sinners. And Paul said, they say, Paul himself said, I'm the greatest sinner. Then who are you to call yourself a saint, they say. So we are used to this idea of us being called sinners. Sometimes we go to church and they call us sinners, literally. They have all these born again, baptized, spirit baptized people sitting there in the audience. And we nail them again and again as sinners, sinners, sinners. Address them as sinners. Tell them how great sin there is in their hearts and how dark their heart is, how bad and evil they are, how no good they are. And if you, Jesus comes today, will you go or not? You know, this is the kind of approach we have. And because of that, the sinner thing has gotten into us. So the saint thing, you know, is unable to get in. And I remember when I first started preaching here, people were you know, fight, trying to fight me and say, my God, well, how can you call us saints? See, they've been calling them sinners. They never fought them. Isn't that something? No, nobody ever went and fought a preacher that said, you're a sinner. When I say you're a saint, they want to fight you because this is bad. He's calling us saints. I didn't call you saint. Paul calls you saint because he thinks, God thinks of you as saint. It's not even Paul calling you a saint. Paul is calling you a saint because he thinks God thinks of you as a saint. So he decides to address you as saint. But you say, well, I don't feel like a saint, brother. Never mind what you feel like. He calls you saint because no matter what you feel like, God says you are a saint. Now, is what God says more important than what you feel? And besides, feelings always come later. You see, people get married, they don't feel married the next moment. Eh? As soon as you say, I take you to be my wife, to have and to adore or whatever, you know, they say. And as soon as you say that and, and the preacher says, now you're man and wife, immediately if you ask the fellow who's getting married, do you feel married? He'll say, no. And you'll find a lot of young people acting like they're unmarried bachelors, you know, because they don't feel married, you know. They don't get a hang of it. You know, they, after they get married also, 
they're just going around and just coming home at 11 o'clock at night and the wife is sitting home and you know they don't even think there's a wife at home you know uh, because they're living their bachelor life because they have lived the last 28 years like that the more you live like that the more you get used to it you know and you think the bachelor style and and you go out and and be as a bachelor and when you come home then your wife starts turning <laughs> when you come home with half your salary she asks where is the rest then you start feeling that you are married when you come late she says where did you go then you start feeling like my god i got another person to answer to there's another half <laughs> usually i leave this half at home but you got to come in confrontation with the other half you can't forget this half this is a real half <laughs> then the feeling comes you know some people say well i don't feel for her you know how will you feel for her have you taken her on honeymoon have you taken her to the beach have you taken her somewhere you know take her somewhere and and go and get along do something and you know then you'll feel <laughs> you won't just feel just like that people are thinking my god this this is for free i'm teaching no cost <laughs> some things are for free <laughs> don't wait for the feeling to come to ten then take her to the honeymoon the reason they send you on the honeymoon is so that you can you'll get the feeling from head to toe you know <laughs> you'll get the feeling and and you'll feel good about everything you know because you know that's the way it is the feeling doesn't come first the fact comes first the fact is that you're married right now how big a fact it is if you go to the church and give the vows and sign the register then to undo it you can't simply say to the preacher i just want to leave her and go home. no you got to go to the court now you got to get a lawyer you got to go to the court and it'll take more than a year in india you know the judge won't readily just give it to you you know he will tell you to go for counseling and one judge told somebody to watch a movie you know <laughs> hoping that will change them yeah I mean they'll take any extreme measure to put you back together you know because what you did see some people don't understand what happened the fact they don't understand they just go on feelings because they don't feel anything for her they say I don't feel nothing for her I don't feel nothing for him so I just want to leave well you won't feel nothing until you try to feel something hello feeling comes only later so in the saint thing also it's the same way the feeling that you are a saint doesn't come first as soon as you confess jesus as lord and savior and receive him in your heart as soon as the holy spirit is poured out in you you don't immediately get a feeling sometimes you may get but you it's not normal you see you don't immediately get a feeling we don't tell you to confess jesus as lord and then say oh, how do you feel like now no you don't feel nothing you see you go home and it's just like yesterday and you know you you don't feel Uh, you know a whole lot has changed you know but then as you get to know jesus as you get to know his word as you talk to him as you love him and serve him and live for him as you go back to church and hear the word more and as you get with people and pray and as you worship him and love him and serve him and keep on doing that i'll tell you you get the feeling more and more and more and the feeling is so good so you want to go back there because the feeling is so good you want to go back and pray you want to go back and fast you want to go back and read the bible you want to do more of it because the feeling is so much more right So don't go by feeling feeling is not first the fact is first the truth is first so when it comes to being saint it is the truth that you are a saint if you don't feel like it then start thinking like a saint start talking like a saint and start living like a saint and then one day you'll start feeling like a saint thanks be to god who always god says us triumph in his name Thanks be to God, who always God says us to win. Yeah. Thanks be to God, who always God says us triumph in His name. Thanks be to God, thanks be to God, we have overcome. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Jesus 
Us to try your fitness name. Thanks be God, who always causes us to win. Yeah. Thanks be God, who always causes us to try your fitness name. Thanks Clap be God. Thanks be God, we have overcome. Jesus, you're the one, hallelujah, hallelujah, the one who made a way for us to triumph in the name of the world. Everything will be all right, all right. We got the victory. Everything will be all right. We're on the winning side. We got the victory. Everything will be all right, all right. We got the victory. Everything will be all right. We're on the winning side. We got the victory. Everything will be. Everything will be all right Cause we're on the winning side We're on the winning side We have overcome Hallelujah, hallelujah We have overcome By the power of your name Jesus, you're the one 